All right, so welcome everyone to our summer uh, CCNA instructor training class for connecting networks. Uh, as I was discussing, I was talking a little bit about the NetLabs. Um, if you get into NetLabs and you're having issues, if you will let me know, I can actually go in and look at every single thing that you type. Um, so it allows me to see if you're, you know, what you may be stuck on. Many times, actually, I've actually had some people go in and do labs and they would have an issue with just an IP address or something and I'm able to jump in and see where um, they've accidentally put in an incorrect IP address. Um, I can see a couple folks have already done some labs in NetLabs. Um, it is very important that we do, or that you do the labs in NetLabs um, because it's real gear and I'm wanting to make sure that you know how to use real gear. It's uh, something that Cisco has allowed people to do um, a good amount of use of Packet Tracer, but um, Packet Tracer is not real gear and we don't have, it's like I always tell y'all, uh, there's no jobs with two to five years of Packet Tracer experience. Um, so be aware of that. Um, in our class, one of the things I've done is like my normal classes, there are modules. In those modules, each one of the chapters has a place for labs and packet tracers. So there happens to be one. You can see chapter one doesn't even have a packet tracer. You also notice that this is a lot less material than we've had in our classes in the past. There's only eight chapters. Um, one of the things I'll do towards uh, the end of this class into August is talk to you about ways I feel you can fill out this class. Um, one way obviously would be just to do a couple weeks of review and prepare your students for the ICND 2 exam. That's always a great option. Another option would be to add in the network programmability with APIC um, emerging technology workshop. Um, that's something I'm probably gonna do and we're gonna do with our student classes. So we're gonna add that in, that content as an additional piece of content uh, for students in this particular class. Cause it does talk about, you know, when we get down here to network evolution and we're talking about software defined networking, we're talking about uh, different items, then we can actually use that uh, Emerging Technologies Workshop to give them hands-on experience playing uh, inside a, an SDN or software-defined network. You also notice that um, with these packet tracer uploads and all, again, once we finish this class, if you need this shell for your own use, I will give it to you and you can import this in and we'll be able to uh, use it for your classes. And that way you won't have to rebuild all of the um, assignments that I've created already. Are there any questions about, and I did, by the way, put all the assignments do have due dates now. Um, please be aware, as I mentioned in the email, the due dates are not set in stone. So if you miss the due date, um, I'm not gonna have a heart attack. Um, I'm not gonna jump up and down and scream at you. I just find that if you're like me and there's no due date, you uh, tend to put it off. Um, so I need something blaring at me that says, hey, this is due, uh, take care of it and make sure that you are you are doing what you should do. Um, so be aware of that, don't, don't freak out. Um, one of the big things about my classes I always tell you is do not freak out. Uh, it is a, um, an important thing that, that we need to know, okay? Other questions? Okay, um, so let's look at uh, chapter one. I think I can blow through chapter one very quickly because it is WAN concepts. I love the fact that the, um, that when we look at WANs, we always think about high speed internet access, but we then start looking at WAN speeds and they're not really that fast, okay? Um, give you a great example. What's the minimum speed associated with say connecting to just a regular computer in your, in your environment, in any, any modern network today, what kind of NIC is on a, is on a computer? Well, maybe a 100. Well, at least most time a gigabit. If, yeah, you tried yeah. to buy, if you tried to buy a PC today without a gigabit um, card, you would have a very difficult time buying that computer, okay? because of the fact that it is, you know, just the standard. But now, how many of you have gigabit internet speed at your house for internet right now? Do any of you? Yeah, not at all. I have 50 megs. 
You have 50. I have uh, yeah. 10 on a good day. Okay. Now, granted, I live out in the boondocks. So, you know, I can actually, um, you know, do about anything I want in the backyard. And nobody's going to say anything. But at the same time, it's one of those things to where the, um, the inability to get high speed internet actually hurts me because if I had high speed internet, I'd be sitting at home doing this meeting right now instead of sitting in my office. Um, so it's not an option for me to do work from home because I, these meetings will simply not work. Even at 10 megabit, I have trouble. 99% um, of the time or I'll try it and then I end up with, with a problem with it. So it's, it's very aggravating. Um, Think about, I do have a coworker who just recently got gigabit speed at his house. So it is slowly coming around, depending on where you're at, but it's not something that's out there a great deal. Even our, our network here on campus only has 500 megabits for its link in and out. Um, so when we talk about high speed internet, it's really not as high speed as what you would think. Point to point topologies, we talk a great deal about that because we talk about the um, we talk about our point-to-point um, -point PPP connections. We talk about uh, PPPoE, so point-to-point -point over Ethernet. Um, there are hub and spokes. This is where you have like a corporate uh, center, and then you have spokes. And this could be um, an MPLS cloud. It could be a frame relay cloud. It could be Metro Ethernet. All of those are different. I call this the uh, full mesh. Sometimes you'll see it with these uh, out here and it looks like a pentagram and I call it the satanic network, but a full mesh which has all the spokes connected fully to one another instead of the hub and spoke um, setting. And here's a dual home where you've got each one of your uh, border routers connects to at least one other um, ISP. Just many people need to be careful to realize, make sure this, if this spoke A is, you know, at t and spoke C is, I don't know, Sprint, you got to make sure they're not actually connected to the same thing past here. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time creating a dual home network. We talk about small offices here. I'm not going to spend much time on this because I believe this is something that's just a review of the different things that you've learned all throughout. This I do want to touch on though because when we look at WANs, we do look at the fact that WANs are um set up so that you have layer two technology so when we look at hdlc what is important about hdlc anybody know what is hdlc high level data link control does anybody know okay that's if you just took your ccna you would know that hdlc is the default encapsulation on any Cisco um, serial interface, all right? By default, if you take two serial interfaces and hook them together, layer two, it's gonna be HDLC. Yeah. If you are doing, uh, if you wanna run PPP, so you wanna do some type of authentication or encryption, um, you have to use the, um, you have to use PPP. So, there's all kinds of things that happen at layer two, but all WANs operate at layer two, um, or LAN protocols operate at layer two and layer one. Um, frame relay, which is going away, some is really pretty much going away. MPLS, VSAT, all of those are layer two technologies. So it's how things are framed, how they are made into frames. Questions about those? All right. Do you understand the difference between a DCE and a DTE? Yes. All right, a DCE, yeah. what is a DCE? Can either one, Elizabeth or, or? Well, that, that side of the link will provide a clocking circuit to the. Correct, and the way to remember that is DCE. By the way, y'all are seeing my, my item, aren't you? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay good, good. So DCE. Um, the DTE, by the way, DC is typically owned by the telecom provider. The DTE is your customer equipment. Now, 
in the real world, we would have some device, some DCE device providing clocking that will get us onto the local loop to get over to the CO switch. In our labs, we don't do that. In our labs, we have um, our DTE, DCE simulated. All right, so we simulate it. If we didn't simulate it, you wouldn't be able to have clocking on your, on your serial interfaces. That's why when you connect the serial interfaces, excuse me, and you have a DCE end and a DTE end, the DCE end, wherever you hook that on your router, that's where you're gonna put your clock rate, all right? And then the DMARC point, that is where basically the customer premise equipment ends and the service provider equipment begins. And we've got all kinds of devices here that are WAN devices, dial-up modems, that's a layer two device, access servers, broadband modems, if you got cable or DSL, you've got a broadband modem. Mine seems to die every three months, um, pretty much. Um, CSU, DSU, that is a channel service unit, data service unit, that would be your DCE device that provides clocking. You've also got them now, instead of just being an actual little box you sit outside, you actually can see um, CSU, DSUs are TSUs. So they're terminal service units that go into their WIC cards that slide in. And then you got routers, obviously, that can get us onto the cloud. And then inside the cloud, we've got our uh, core routers and WAN switches. Now, one of the things that you do need to be able to delineate between is circuit switch network and a um, packet switch network. In a circuit switch network, it's like the old timey um, phone connections when the, the operator would literally take one cable and connect it to A and connect it to B and then you know, John and Jane could talk to each other. It actually, what it does when you have a circuit switch is it dials and creates a channel or a circuit between A and B. It will maintain that circuit while there's communications between A and B. So there's an actual virtual circuit being created. And then when the communication is over, it will tear down that circuit. So Circuit switch networks don't maintain typically a circuit at all times. It's only when there's actual information going across it. Now, if it is a permanent virtual circuit, that's even worse because if this circuit becomes congested, there's no way for it to uh, move past the circuit that's been created. More modern ways of doing things are packet switch, where we break everything into packets. We throw it out into this packet switch cloud and then let it find its best path through it to the destination. Now, uh, of course, you've got to have some type of way to retransmit, some type of way to, to recreate uh, the segments once they're received. But at layer two for packet switching, it is connectionless, pretty much depending on the protocol you're using. It can be connectionless. IP itself is connectionless. So it requires TCP to, to provide guaranteed reliable delivery. So you can have connectionless systems and you can have connection oriented systems where you actually have um, a temporary circuit that then is broke down like a virtual circuit. Um, but the big thing is instead of having a connection that's up all the time, we typically break everything down and then send it through and let it find its way through. So here we go, different options. This could show up on your exam for the chapter especially, but privates, dedicated lease lines like T1s, E3s. We're getting away from that because we're doing a lot of dark fiber and Metro Ethernet now. Um, but that is a dedicated lease line. You've got, uh, if you're doing switched, you could do a circuit switch, PSTN or ISDN. ISDN, we used to actually learn ISDN in CCNA. We'd have to actually configure it. Uh, that was years and years ago. I think Elizabeth, you said you've been a CCNA for a while now, so you may have seen that way back in the in the beginnings of time. And uh, let's see, we're meeting controls. Somebody else show up. Oh, hey, Corey, I didn't see you jump in. Basil, is, uh, Basil and Corey, you may have seen ISDN too. Has anybody ever worked with ISDN? I haven't. I had years ago. Do what? I had, we had one location I worked with it years ago. Years and years ago? Okay. Yeah, a long time. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not, um, it's not fun. Um, it's, it's not terrible, but it's, it's not the, the most fun you'll ever have in your life. Um, but I will tell you something that, that people get confused by. ISDN is a dial-up technology. 
And in fact, when you see it come up, you can actually see it establish the connection. You can see it maintaining the connection when you debug it, and you can see it dropping the connection when it's over. So um, that is that is ISDN. In packet switch, we've got a great deal of Metro Ethernet now. So we're doing Ethernet to our businesses. Um, some people do use MPLS, out, MPLS or possibly you've got MPLS at your service provider. Frame relay used to be what we used everywhere, but now it's kind of gone the way of the, the, the dinosaur because we've got Ethernet. And then finally, ATM. Um, big thing there is 53 byte cells. Remember that. Uh, 48 bytes for data, five bytes for um, or control, but ATM used to be a, a way to do packet switched on um, on WAN networks. And then we've also got these, this DSL cable and wireless, including business DSL, BS, business cable. The big problems when you go with business cable and uh, DSL is typically they do not have the service level agreement that you will get if you lease or get a different type of connection from your ISP. Of course, we do have satellites. Uh, just came back from teaching military class and they deal a great deal with satellites. Um, I was actually just reading an article about this, DWDM, about how, uh, I believe it was an early, one of the early implementations of it, but uh, dense wave, um, brain farting here, um, dense wavelength division multiplexing. So taking multiple incoming signals and then using timing methods to ensure that all of those can be placed onto a single fiber and then um, allowed to go out the correct fiber when they go where they need to be uh, sent out. You see that DWDM, um, dense wave division multiplexing, can do bi-directional communication, can multiplex more than 80 different channels of data or wavelengths on a single piece of fiber. And then each of those channels can carry up to 10 gigabits. So 800 gigabits of data multiplexed with DWDM. Um, pretty, pretty neat thing and without it, it would be very difficult for us to have the internet because that's where all the submarine cables are used to do DWM across the, the world. Um, has anybody ever worked with DWDM like Sonat networks or any type of the underground water or the submarine based cabling? No. I haven't, I mean, that's, you know, I'm. One of the places I'm weak is in some of these areas here because I haven't worked in an ISP environment. Leased lines, why are they good? Well, they're simple. Most time a leased line appears as a point to point line for you. Um, the quality is usually very good because they are digital, high quality digital lines. Um, they can be consistently available most of the time. Um, the problem is they are a little more costly than some of the other methods. Um, but their service level agreement is higher. Um, so that's one of the things. We don't have the flexibility, but we do have a high service level agreement. Typically, lease lines run on PPP or HDLC, depending upon um, how they're connected. I will tell you this, HDLC, although it is an open protocol, every vendor implements it in their own way. So if you run an HDLC on a Cisco device, an HDLC on a... Um, extreme networks device, they probably will not talk to each other. So you may have to run PPP in order to have a true open standard. And then last but not least, the old dial-up. You know, I used to have, I actually had a 2600 ball modem back in the day um, when I went to 56 and then, you know, it's 56K and then 114.4, we were just, we thought it was the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. ISDN, there are basically two types, but, uh, two types, basic rate ISDN, which is two 64K channels for data and 116D channel for um, control. So they're bearer channels and delta channels are, are control channels. And then primary rate ISDN is 23B if you're in the United States. Uh, and then um, is it three, three um, and one D channel, sorry, one D channel. But if you're in Europe, it's actually 30B channels um, and 1D channel. So in Europe and in Australia, their T1s are actually a little faster than ours. We're 1.544 megabits per second, whereas they're 2.048. It's just the way they decided to do their, their channeling of the, um, the uh, 
PRI interface. Frame relay used to be the bee's knees. This used to be what we used. Um, you would have delsies, which are really only locally significant. I don't like the way they put this delsie pointing toward the branch office because really the delsie was only significant between your device and the frame relay switch that sat right here at the corporate headquarters or right here at the ISP in the cloud. So the DLC is really only important between R1 in this cloud and R2 in the cloud. Now the ISP would map the DLCs in their switches to be able to allow you to do a virtual circuit, but um, the, the branch office and the, and the other offices, corporate head office, really the DLCs were not normally globally significant. They can be, they're typically not. These are used with leased lines. So we're doing T1s, E1s, T3s. Here's ATM, again, it was 50, uh, 53 bytes, five byte header and a 48 byte payload. That's the only thing it was able to do, voice, video, um, and data all at one time and multiplex it and then actually do quality of service. And it was actually a very good, um, it was very good layer two protocol. The problem was it was very difficult to set up and it only topped out at about 100 and really topped out around 155 megabits per second. Now they've got it up to 622, but um, it, I think it was just so complicated when it first came out that people kind of shied away from it. Plus ethernet just kept getting faster and faster and faster. So now we've got this, you basically are running uh, fiber between your different campuses or offices as much as possible. That fiber may go into an MPLS cloud by your service provider, um, depending on what's going on. And so uh, they may be running uh, ethernet over MPLS, EO MPLS. Um, so it's, it's, that's the way that if you can get your network hooked into the internet today, we try our best to do. And this, a lot of people have trouble with MPLS, but it's really honestly just frame tagging. So in other words, when, in this case, you've got a, um, an ISP with four different customers and however they get into the MPLS, MPLS cloud, be it a leased line, frame relay or Metro ethernet, really doesn't matter. But what matters is that their traffic gets tagged in that cloud and can be therefore shaped to only go to certain places. So let's imagine that this T1 up here on the left only wanted to talk to the, the Metro Ethernet on the right. Well, in the cloud, you can tag that traffic and ensure that only those two sites will be able to talk to each other and only those two sites would see that traffic so that you've got security over MPLS. Um, so really let the, what it lets the ISP do is it lets them take their infrastructure and share it with every one of their customers. We don't do a lot with MPLS in this class because of the fact it is an ISP topic. Um, so we won't talk about that much. And then we've got satellite technology. This uh, is very interesting in light of um, what um, SpaceX is doing with the Starlink. Um, I think that's the name of their system where they just put 60 satellites in orbit um, and they're looking to continuously do more launches to send satellites up to where um, by the end of this year, early next year, they hope to have the entire United States covered to where you could buy internet access from them via satellites. And it would be high speed and it would be um, low latency because of the number of satellites they're gonna have up there. Um, so that's gonna be very interesting. They're actually planning to put almost 13,000 satellites up and cover the entire known habited, inhabited world so that anybody anywhere can get internet access, which would be a, um, it's a momentous thing to try to do, but it would also be an unbelievable um, item if it, once it takes place, because I actually think they will make it happen. Have they said how much it would cost? They have not. There's been no indication as to what it will cost. Um, estimates are between 100 and 150 for 800 to a gig. Um, so, but I'll be honest with you, I'll buy it tomorrow if they turn it on, um, just because I don't have any other options. Um, my only other option is to hope for a fight, you know, some 5G that comes close to my house so I can tag into 5G, but um, otherwise I'm, I'm pretty much stuck with, with what I've got. So, um, but I would figure that in that range. Of course, as they get more subscribers, I'm sure it will become simpler or not simpler, but uh, cheaper. What about WiMAX? 
Wimax is out there. Um, I don't have any of that in my area. Um, I know there was a, a great deal of Wimax implementations going out, and it seemed like everybody just stopped for some reason. Um, kind of like Google Fiber. They were putting in Google Fiber, and then they stopped. I think everybody right now is holding their breath for 5G um, just to see what's going to happen there uh, with, that, with that technology. This is DSL. You've got your DSL modem that goes to the DSLAM. Um, it kills the people when I call in and go, yeah, I'm not training my line two to your DSLAM. And they're like, what? I said, yeah, look at it. And they're like, yeah, you're right. Cause you can see it easily in the, the status of the DSL modem. So, but the DSLAM is typically at your, um, at a, um, some type of cabinet that's out in, in the, the neighborhood. You, the big thing here is DSL has a limit of about 15,000 feet from the DSLAM to the DSL modem. And so it's got some big limitations. They had to put a special uh, repeater in for us to get 10 megabits per second. We were accidentally getting two and they put one of those repeaters in to give us 10. So it's still not great, but eh, it's better than nothing. Cable has pretty much the same concept except they have a longer range they can go. Um, but there's still the big problem with cable is they'll put in one of these CMTS systems and they'll have like a one gig link or a 10 gig link back and then they'll sell 50 gig connections to that one CMTS. So they oversubscribe it to the point to where um, you just don't have, you know, you don't have the bandwidth you're supposed to have on the back end. Um, it'll appear like you've got it, but you really don't. And of course, here's wireless, again, WireMax, um, municipal Wi-Fi, WireMax, um, satellite internet, all of these are, are getting out there. Um, I'm going to Cisco Live next week, which by the way, I got to tell you, I'm traveling the next three weeks. So um, being able to do a meeting may not be able to happen. So the first, maybe the first of July, before I actually get back with you, I'm going to look at my schedule and see if it's possible. I might be able to do a Tuesday when I'm in... Uh, in Canada or in uh, in Louisville uh, for for Skills USA, but um, I just did my schedule for Cisco Live next week, and there's so many 5G things I want to go to to learn more about. So I, I think 5G is going to be a big game changer. Um, it's supposed to have the bandwidth and the low latency to do things like self-driving cars and IoT and <clears throat> all the things we've we've not been able to do to this point. So here again, we've got LTE with 4G, but 5G is coming in faster. And then we've got our VPN technologies. Um, big one here is you, there are two types. There are site-to-site -site VPNs, and those are VPNs that go from a um, device that the corporation owns to a device the corporation owns. So a site-to-site, -site, they, they know the IP addresses on both sides and then create the tunnel on both sides. The devices in a site-to-site -site VPN really don't even know that they're going through a VPN. They don't have a clue um, it, because the tunnel just exists between the, the networking devices. So that works great if you control the networking devices. The problem becomes when you've got workers traveling somewhere like San Diego to a conference and they need to connect to the school to get their information, well, you don't control the ISP or the router that's that particular user is sitting at. So what you have to do is create a remote access VPN. And that VPN take, goes from software on the PC to the, the actual VPN end device. Now it can be an IPsec tunnel, it can be an SSL, it can be an SSL gateway. Um, so there's different ways to do it, but, but with site to site, uh, again, the users don't even know they're on a VPN tunnel. Whereas with a remote access, the software and the tunnel uh, originates on the user's device. Do all of you have VPN access to your school? No. I would figure so. Yes, I do, yes. No. No, okay. Be bad if you didn't, that, it, because, well, it depends. As long as you can get your email, that's typically all we need, right? Yeah. Well, we have it for uh, to sign up for training classes. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, any questions on chapter one? Good. Everybody good? All right. Let's talk real quickly about part of chapter two. We're going to talk about point to point. 
Now, when we say point to point serial connections, we're talking about the ability to go from point A to point B and run some layer two protocol across it. So we're gonna look here at the difference between a serial and a parallel connection. When we're sitting here with a serial connection, we've got one link and you've got to send the information across one bit at a time or one byte once it gets done with the, the bytes. You'll notice in parallel, they're able to send multiple different connections at one time, okay? So it's sequentially over a single channel. Now it's slower, all right? But it is um, the way that we work across point-to-point -point links. In a point-to-point -point Cisco connection by default on a serial interface, HDLC is our layer two protocol. So if we were buying a leased line between New York and London, and it was two Cisco devices, they would run HDLC across this link. The problem is HDLC is not compatible between all vendors, so we get into some problems. Here are some of the different transmission rates for serial communications that we find across our leased lines. Everything from a T1, uh, which is 1.54, all the way up to an OC768, which is 39.813 gigabits per second. Um, and those are our fiber or optical standards. So when you go get anything that's OC, it's an optical standard. I wouldn't worry about memorizing all of these. I would probably know a T1 and a T3 and just know that an E1 is a little more than a T1 um, because that, and also same thing with a T3, that sometimes shows up uh, in conversations, but it's not as big a deal as, um, you don't have to learn all these by any stretch of imagination. So when we're looking at our WAN encapsulation protocols at layer two, we've got HDLC, Again, the default protocol for Cisco serial lines. We've got PPP, which is an open standard that's compatible between all vendors. We've got SLIP. Now SLIP was the precursor to PPP. SLIP uh, required you to have a uh, static IP address. It also required you to have a username and password and you, you could not do any encryption of that, that username or password when it's being sent. So it has really been replaced completely by PPP. Um, we do have down for our circuit switched HDLC, PPP, and SLIP work. Now in packet switch though, we've gotta be running X25, and X25 is a precursor to frame relay. It's basically um, frame relay with some error checking abilities in it that are not present in frame relay. Now the reason people get confused by it, they say, well, why does frame relay, which is a newer layer two protocol, have less error checking in it than X25. Well, X25 was actually devised when our circuits were not as clear or not as clean. In other words, we didn't have as high quality circuits as we have now. You know, we may have been running across Cat1, Cat2, Cat, well, Cat3 cable. Um, so we had more noise, we had more interference. As we moved into our digital, uh, very high quality lines, they found they could take what was um, X25 pull out some of the uh, processes, the error correction, flow control, they mentioned it here in X25, and it would still work just fine because we didn't have the problems of these inconsistent links. And then we also have ATM, which again has the ability to do uh, multiplexing of all different services using fixed link cells. Uh, the good news about that is it is easier for uh, end devices to process because it is a fixed link cell. So here is HDLC standard encapsulation, which only supports one single protocol. And then Cisco's HDLC, which supports multiple protocols. So in other words, it can support multiple upper layer protocols. Um, because of this, even though you have HDLC and the vendors are supposed to be interoperable, they're not. So Cisco's HDLC will not talk with other vendors. If you want to configure HDLC, first off, do nothing because it should already be on the interface. If you do a show interface, it will show that the H, uh, HDLC is the protocol on that interface. If for some reason it gets changed to PPP and you want to change back or it gets changed to any other protocol, just go into the serial interface and type encapsulation HDLC. And by the way, this is only for serial interfaces because on the inter, uh, gigabit ethernet or on the ethernet interfaces, the encapsulation is ethernet. 
This is a very important slide for you and your students to, to, to look at because when you're troubleshooting a serial interface, there's a lot of different things that can happen. Um, first off, we'll start with the easy one. If serial X is up, up, life is good, okay? So basically this first item is layer one and a carrier sense. Here's an example, by the way, of showing encapsulation HDLC on the serial interface. So kit layer one is up and layer two is up. So we're good here. If you've got down, down, this means you're not getting a layer one carrier signal. So there's no, you may want to go check to even see if there's a cable plugged in. Is it plugged in the wrong serial interface? Which is very common with students when they're trying to connect to a, uh, a WIC and you've got 000 and 0001 and they'll connect to the wrong one. Up, down, now this would be, you've got a carrier, okay, so layer one is working, but something is wrong with layer two, all right? Could be one side's PPP, one side's HDLC. Could be you're running encapsulation PPP with authentication and authentication is failing, okay? If you get looped, that's typically your CSU DSU has been put into a looped mode, so that's usually a testing mode. All right, um, let's see, disabled, I gotta remember what that one is, because I don't remember, sorry about that, but. Loop, like I said, that's when you've basically done the loop back on it. CSU, DSU problem, so that's a high error rate on the WAN side, okay? So that's usually that, or um, if it's disabled, it's also that same thing, so it's uh, either one of those is usually something from the WAN side from the ISP. Last but not least is this administratively down. You've just forgotten to bring it up, okay? This command show controllers, we haven't run before. Um, if you're ever in a situation where you can't get to a, a device to look at its actual, its interfaces to see whether or not the DCE end is on one side or the other or which side is connected to the DCE, if you do show controllers and look at the interface itself, it will tell you what it's connected to. In this case, it shows it's connected to a DCE B35 cable. So show controllers can show you exactly what it's connected to. Any questions about those? I'm good. All right. So we got some packet tracers here. Now I'm gonna quickly blow through uh, PPP, but what we've got here is uh, PPP or point to point protocol is an open standard layer two WAN protocol. It's got three main components. First is an HDLC like framing encapsulation for point to point. Now the big thing about a point to point, you really don't need any type of source or destination address, do you? Because if it leaves point A in a point to point, where's it going? Point B. So you don't, there's no real addressing needed here. You do need a link control. Now, one of the reasons this is here is because PPP is an extension or a, has derived from SLIP, and SLIP was originally a dial-up protocol. So when I had dial-up internet access, I had a SLIP account way back in the, the, uh, the day, back in the 90s. So because it was a dial-up to begin with, you needed a link control protocol, the ability to, to establish the link, maintain the link, and tear it down. Then PPP was also devised to support multiple upper layer, layer three protocols. So there's network control protocols, Apple Talk, IPX, SPX, um, IP, all different types of network control protocols that PPP can use. So some of the advantages, uh, it can do link quality management. In other words, you can actually set it up to where um, if the error percentage drops, the link will be taken down and or if a certain percentage of errors are occurring, you can have the link drop so that we use an alternate path. It also supports PAP and CHAP. And PAP, again, is useless authentication, but CHAP is um, definitely a uh, authentication that will not be, uh, will not send usernames and, and passwords in clear text. So here we see our layered architecture. We've got our physical media. We've got the link control protocol. This is kind of analogous to our, uh, our Mac and LLC layers. So you know your media access control layer and logical link control. This is very similar because you've got this link control protocol that, that establishes the link, does link management, uh, does quality management, authentication, 
once that's established, then network control protocol is established, whether it's IPCP, which is IPv4, IPv6 CP, or any of the other supported network uh, protocols. So, all right, load up now, come on. Link control protocol. There we go. Uh, it handles um, varying li the limits on packet size, detecting misconfigurations such as authentication on one, air on one end and not on the other end, um, terminating the link if it doesn't meet our uh, quality management uh, settings, um, and also once this has to occur, in other words, you will not have NCP established unless LCP is established. So you've got to have that first. And then our network control protocol is what's used to pass information up to layer three. And you can see the different values in that protocol field for the different uh, protocols that are supported by NCP. So you've got everything, some of the older protocols, Novell, AppleTalk, OSI, CHAP, and PAP, all of those are supported. And here's our frame structure. We've got a flag, address. You'll notice there it says all ones because you don't need individual addresses. You just broadcast it out one end and it goes to the other side. You got to control the protocol. Okay, it tells you encapsulated what is uh, in the uh, PPP payload and then your data and then your frame check sequence. So that's all right here with the flag at the end to show that the, the frame is ended. So a very simple frame for PPP. So when we establish a session, uh, the link control protocol says, shall we negotiate? And then we'll determine, all right, are we gonna do authentication? Are we gonna have link quality determination? Once that is connected and you've got your link control protocol session established, then it will go to the NCP and say, hey, let's establish a network control protocol. I'm running IPv4 and IPv6. What are you running? I'm running IPv4 and IPv6 too, so let's, we can send those across PPP. And again, here we see LCP configure request, and then we get an ACK, and once that's complete, so when we configure LCP, then we do our NCP exchange, and then we get all of our information echo request, reply, and we can do our maintenance. In other words, data exchange, um, making sure that we've got um, our uh, authenticate, re-authentication with CHAP, all of those items that happen. Now, PPP can terminate the link. So let's imagine that it's going through here and it wants to terminate the link, it can do it. So let's say it fails, there's a, there's a data exchange and we try to do a chat reauthentication and it fails. Well, LCP will terminate the link and then it will have to be reestablished. So here's some of our options again, authentication, compression, and um, also you can do um, stack or predictor, okay? Um, stacker or predictor. Predictor um, uses less memory, whereas staggers, and again, it's just a way of doing that. So here we have our, our different IPv4 data exchange. We're doing IPCP. So again, nothing real crazy here. Any questions about these establishment of these different? I'm good. Corey, you're good. Basil, Elizabeth? Yes, continue. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. So some of the things you can do is configuration options. Obviously, we've talked about authentication and compression and error detection. There is a thing called PPP callback. Uh, back in the day, you could dial in, and when you dialed in, it would automatically see the phone number you came in on, drop the call, and then call you back and establish it. Um, that was so that the uh, person needing access to the network the call would come from a phone line controlled by the company. You also had the ability to do what's called PPP multi-link, where you could take multiple different dial-in lines or just multiple different connections and put them together kind of like an ether channel, um, but using PPP instead of ethernet. Now, here's the great news. Here's how easy PPP is. If you want two sides to use PPP, type encapsulation PPP on both sides, on the serial interfaces. You're done, you're running PPP. At a basic, that's all you gotta do. And it could be a Cisco router, an extreme router, it could be a Dell router, it could be whatever, it'll work. It gets a little more 
funny when you're trying to do compression, okay? So you can do compression predictor, compress pre or compress predictor or um, stacker, one of the two, okay? You wanna do quality management, you just do a, a quality, so PPP quality 80. So if at any time it drops below uh, 80 in quality, and so uh, it will actually drop the link. So it looks in both directions. So it's looking at the number of packets dropped and everything. So as long as um, you're losing no more than 20%, then you would be, it would, the link would stay up and stay in use. And then multi-link. So this is a little different because you do have to create a multi-link interface. Uh, back in the day, we created dialer interfaces and type those types of things, but you create a multi-link interface and then you take multiple different serial interfaces and make them part of that group, multi-link, PPP multi-link group one, and then tell it to be multi-link. And then it would actually take those two and they would appear as one multi-link connection, PPP connection, sharing the bandwidth of those two serial interfaces, which is kind of cool. Again, it's, kind of, it's, it's like ether channel with a PPP. And you should know what ether channel is at this point, hopefully. So to verify it, show interface 0000, will show you if it's encapsulation PPP. This also shows you that LCP is open, which means it has been established. It also shows you all the different network control protocols you're running here. So in this case, we're running off PCP, V6, CCP, and CDCP, so Cisco Discovery Protocol. You can do show interfaces, show interface serial, show PPP multi-link. And that will show you our multi-link if we happen to have a multi-link. And then now authentication. This is where it gets a little bit weird because they talk about PAP authentication, which it is authentication. But the problem is you send your username and password in clear text. Um, and that's simply not something you ever want to do. Um, we should be using CHAP with our PPP. And that way there's a challenge. And then it sends a, the username with a hash. And then the hash is compared to a hash on R3. And it's either accepted or rejected. So these two types. Um, of the two, we really should only use CHAP if you want true um, security. The good thing too about CHAP is CHAP also does periodic re-authentications. So uh, with PPP, you're authenticated once and that's it. You know, you will stay authenticated. With CHAP, it will actually re-authenticate re uh, every um, a random amount of time. So again, here we have username R1, password Cisco123. We send the username, if it meets or it's okay, then it will be accepted. And then vice versa, central will send one to router, or you can do one-way authentication, depending on how you want to do it. I'm on, yeah, hold on a second. Hold on one second, folks. Sorry, y'all, one of my uh, coworkers come in. So. But here we have three-way chat handshake. So you get a challenge, all right? It sends a response of the username and a hash, and then the central router will look in its local database and see if it hash this with the same algorithm, and which is message MD5 typically, and it will either accept or reject it based upon that. So we'll look in the local database for that remote user's username and password that was sent. A cool thing is, again, uh, you can do, it would be both ways. You also end up with um, unpredictable re-challenges or re-authentication uh, re being asked for. So we can do PPP authentication CHAP, CHAP-PAP, which allow to do CHAP, and if it didn't support CHAP, then PAP, or PAP-CHAP, or just PAP. Personally, let's just use CHAP because that's the only one that's really secure, folks. So here we have authentication. With PAP, you do the user. All right, R2 with the same password as R1, and they have to be the same password. And then you can use the same password across, and you say sent username R1, which matches here. So all the passwords need to be the same. And that's the configuration there. We're doing chat. 
you can actually just do R2 password, same one, and R1 password, same one, and do authentication. By default, it will send uh, its username will be, it will send the R1, okay, and it will send the, the, the hash of the password. Now, sometimes you can use the enable secret password. There's also a sent username and a sent password command you can use. So there's multiple ways of doing this, uh, but this is the simplest way of doing chat authentication. And folks, that's all I'm gonna do. That's pretty much it. I'm gonna call it a day on these. I would like for you to continue to work on these, um, uh, continue to work on the chapters. Um, like I said, hopefully uh, even next week when I'm in uh, San Diego, I'll be able to jump on on Tuesday. I will, if I see that my schedule is gonna be available, I will. Uh, I'll send out a, a, a meeting link for everybody. If not, then we'll have to wait till the next week when I'm in uh, Toronto. So I'm pretty sure on Tuesday in Toronto or even in Monday night, Actually, I know on Monday night in Toronto I could because I'm free that night. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll try to make that happen. Uh, I'm gonna stop the recording. Stop the share also. I'm gonna stop the share and I'm going to stop the recording. As soon as I can find my recording.